Well, good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to the Columbus Museum of Art and our program today, which is We Fall Apart as Whole, exploring Amina Robinson, Richard Duart Brown, and Black love and resilience. Black love oftentimes is an act of a resilience which resonates as power and beauty in spaces and places throughout the world. It is a guide, signpost, and marker for Black people who oftentimes find themselves falling apart, yet remaining whole as a people, community, and family. Exploring the idea of Amina Robinson's ragging on, including the often silent dialogue about Amina's relationship with her son, Sydney. Today's talk will examine the culture carriers who exemplify the importance of holding on to family and community in both good and bad times, and the richness of Black people who preserve the culture and aesthetics of Black life. I would like to acknowledge the deaths of those people in Buffalo at the hands of hate and discrimination and recognize that this too shall follow with resilience through black love. I am Deidre Hamler and the director of the Amina Robinson Legacy Project. Today's program pairs two impressive people who are committed to shining the light of Amina Robinson's inspiration in all directions, Dr. Terrence Dean and Richard Duart Brown. Dr. Terrence Dean is Assistant Professor of Black Studies at Denison University and First Columbus Museum of Art, Amina Robinson Scholar in Residence. Richard Duart, as we know him and call him and respect him, is a master artist and teacher for Transit Arts Youth Program and Ohio Alliance for Arts Education's Art in the House Program and serves numerous other schools and social services agencies throughout the community. Today, he is speaking as the 2022 Amina Robinson Fellow where from January through March, 2022, Duart had the rare opportunity to produce his, his art in Amina Robinson's home studio. It has been a busy year for Duart as he was also recently awarded the 2022 Governor, Governor's Award for the Arts in Ohio for Arts Education. Let's take a look at a video about Duart from this week's Governor's Awards program. In the meantime, I would like to acknowledge the photos that you saw at the opening as you entered the room um, was a collage of photos that was produced by Dante Spikes Woods, who is um, an historian, I think, if you will, for the project, for the Richard Duart Bound project and many other roles he plays here at the Columbus Museum of Art. So I'd like to acknowledge him for that. Teacher, mentor, and artist, Richard Duart Brown has a 40-year legacy of inspiring children to express themselves creatively, whether working in urban areas like Franklin County or the rural areas beyond. Duart serves as the resident artist for Transit Arts, a program of Central Community House, and he partners with the Art in the House program led by the Ohio Alliance for Arts Education. For more than a decade, both organizations have relied on Duart to represent them in spaces where young people come to create and learn about the arts. The biggest lesson is as a teacher, as a, a leader, or as a mentor, is when you give someone a brush or a tool, you have to give them the freedom to paint the way they were born to paint, not the way you want them to paint. Sometimes people express quicker than others. Some may take a long time and you don't think because they're silenced that they're not taking it in. You have to know how when to wait for what's coming and when it comes, just let it surprise you, let it uplift life and let it, let it elevate man's existence. 
you think that we're teaching students, but actually the teachers themselves and the adults are learning with the students, students and processing their own fears and uncertainties. Caring, passionate, and dedicated, Duart shares his talent generously, teaching students how to create meaningful visual art, all while mentoring them into their adulthood. Kids can recognize when somebody is honest and authentic. Kids can shut down in a classroom. The reason I took to Duarte Duarte is because I was one of the kids that pretty much died in the classroom because I didn't feel comfortable with Duarte. You can just talk to him and he'll say something that resonates with you and it's so real and it's so authentic that it gives you a chance to open up and share what you feel and share what you think or you'll say, wow, well, this is what's going on with my father. This is what's going on with my mother. This is what happened in my neighborhood. You start to just open up and say, "Why wow, I have a chance to really talk about who I am. And as we got inside this school, all of the children started to open up to do art, started to talk to him, started to come up to him because I saw that he used his art as a medium to connect. And then you add the vulnerability on top of that. You have somebody that opens up a door for conversation. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Duart took on a special project with the graduating class at Whitehall Yearling High School, giving the seniors a proper send off by painting 200 portraits and having them placed on the main street of Whitehall for all the city to see. The project garnered national media attention. They all became like family, but this particular guy, um, he never had words to say. And I think his brother passed away when school graduated and he was friends with another person after COVID and what happened, he, reached out to me on Instagram and told me that his mother was stuck in and it was tough. And I said, well, how you doing? And I said, well, I love you. He said, that's all I want you to say. So sometimes they're calling you just to connect. But the idea of painting these young people was just to, um, I don't know, just to honor me. It was just a, a real lucky, I, everybody tells me what a great job I did. I felt lucky having the chance to do it. When you get these banners and you look at this, it gives me a chance to look at, oh my God, the dreams inside of them. Seeing Duarte and how he can find any kid, any kid, and he can make them feel seen. He can make them feel loved, appreciated, heard, all in just five minutes. As you can see, we are so honored to have had Richard Duart Brown represent the Amina Robinson Legacy Project as its 2022 fellow. And we are equally honored to bring him to the stage today to talk to Dr. Terrence Dean. And I hope you enjoy the conversation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear us? Great, good, good, thank you, thank you so much. It's good to see everyone here on a Sunday. I wanna thank you, Deidre, um, for organizing this conversation. It's such a critical time to have this um, necessary dialogue. And I wanna thank um, the Columbus Museum of Art for this, for this opportunity as well. You as a fellow of Amina Robinson, Myself as a scholar in residence um, with the museum. I also want to thank Deidre for acknowledging the massacre that happened yesterday in Buffalo um, for the 11 people who were shot and killed at the grocery store. And I've been thinking about that a lot in the past 24 hours. Um, because I'm a, as a professor, I teach um, intro to black studies. And in that course, um, there's a section where we talk about the nadir, N-A-D-I-R. Have any of you all heard of the nadir? So the, the nadir is actually um, described as the lowest moment in American history. And they um, refer it to the lynching movement that happened um, throughout the South. 
So they call it the Nadir. Um, after slavery, Jim Crow, and it's at the lowest moment in American history. And as we'll talk today, um, and Deidre talked about Black resilience, Black love. And when I talk to my students in the classroom, we look at the threads that continue the history and the legacy of Black people and how we are so intricately woven into the narrative and story and the history. And I wondered, has the Nadir ended? Was that the lowest moment in American history or are we still living in the continual lowest moment of American history? And I looked at the images and we talked about the yarn yeah. that is, if you all can see in his images here and there, um, the border is yarn. And Duar, I would love for you to explain why you did that, the intentionality behind it, and why that is critical. And I'll, and I'll weave that back into why I'm addressing that. Sure. Um, so uh, the way I've navigated as an artist was to make art with young people. And many times it's funded. So um, one of the ladies, Jackie and I were talking about um, what we're going to do for art show artwork and and what, usually the way I find out what I'm going to do is I go to bed I get up and what I see in the morning I know and this particular morning I woke up with a ball of yarn in my face and and I tried to explain that's what we're going to do for art show and they looked at me like how are we going to explain that to the funders and I remember being adamant about it and and it was laid aside but when we got to the Mina house um, right away I was in a place to do whatever I that was in my spirit to do. So literally that was like, literally like over 20 years ago when we had that debate and, or whatever you call that, wow. that delay, <laughs> delay in moving forward. Um, so when I got there, I found this yarn and what happens, you know, Amina was a rag and on artist, which means she went on and on with pieces that continued. They were never finished. So when you say, what did I make here? and What I make there? I'm in a process of letting things out of my mind or out of my spirit mm. to put in a place of, of, of the need. So if, if we're going to do a live painting and we're going to meet somebody, it's a collaboration of whoever's in it, whatever's in the mix and whatever, we, like if Buffalo was to happen, I would be addressing Buffalo somehow in my work. And so they would be weaved into this ball of unraveling yarn that goes in and out of every kind of course and experience. So when I was in that house, it came together. And that's how suddenly I had a chance to go back and dialogue with Sydney. You know, to me about sitting. And if I cry, please forgive me. It's not sadness. It's the, as you speak, some things sit in us in different places. Some places are right here and, and we can carry forth and portray what we need to portray in front of others. Then some places we can go in and, and pour out. So the collecting of tears is, is vital. It's, it's precious. And even if we haven't got to that place, the tears that help us endure make it through it's, it's an abundance of life <laughs> no i totally understand thank you for that it's very emotional it's sentimental um and the images that you see is he's referring to a sydney which is amina's son um, who took his own life at the age of 28 so we're going to talk about the power of sydney showing up and how that resonates in the work because so many times people come in and out of our lives and we want to make sure we acknowledge their presence, yeah. but acknowledge those when they move on, but how do we continue to keep their legacy living on? Yes. And I think that's very powerful what you're doing here in this piece. So thank you. I, I know it's a very emotional, so I thank you for that. Well, honor, it's my honor. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let's talk about your year as a fellow oh, goodness. in the house. Um, <clears throat> and I think people, we, we tend to forget like literally a, a year ago, even though we, we're in public now. We were in a pandemic. Yes. <laughs> so you were going in and out of the home, going home. You had other things to attend to. Um, how was that experience going back and forth in community, out of community, um, in the home, and seeing what was happening in the world and, and creating art? Um, it, it's like this, a lot of things. It's just uh, what I knew was real became realer because it was my intention to document artists 
what I call the East Side Canon artists okay. that might not be in our canon of history or our canon of encyclopedia or, or even in our schools. So being a, a Teach Arts Ohio artist, even when I had a chance to work at a place called Shortstop and go into Ames and meet Miss Howard, a lady who started a school called ACLA, she, um, wanted, she wanted Black men in front of kids. And bottom line, she did what she could to make that happen. Um, when I was raised, I was told um, I had to go to New York to be an artist and that everything that's been done has already been done. So there's no use doing anything. Mm. So for a while, I got quiet and, and I just was thinking. And then I think I, my mother and my brother were telling me, not because they wanted to kill me, kill my dream. It was because they wanted to protect me and give me the reality dose of medicine on life. Mm. So... Um, I remember looking at my mother and my brother and sitting there and saying, New York will come to me. And, um, and I was uh, still not 10 or 11 yet, but that was me all my life. So I was this person that had a, a mission or a vision to, to, to create life from, a, from illustrating stories. And it was, it was inspired by a guy named Jane London. I saw in New Jersey where I'm born and in Lang City, we were you know home a lot. I was older than five younger ones. So I felt it was my responsibility to take care of them. At nine, I learned how to cook, you know, fry bacon and boiled potatoes. Um, and that's what our cooking consists of. And my mother was a fusser. And so, so if, I, if I say things that offend you, please forgive me. But she, she, would, she would say things like, you kids ruined her GD life. She fussed. And so when I got to school, I met a fifth grade teacher named Mr. Steele. So I was 11 at that time. And if I'm saying too many things, tell me to stop and go back to your original question, because <laughs> this is how I do. No, no, I wrote in and out of that yarn. But um, um, that, that's where I met Mr. Steele. And he was the, the first Black teacher I ever had. And, and he wasn't a fusser. And when, I, when he talked, he, it was like I was waiting for the instructions he gave me as a, as a man, how to be a man. Mm -hmm. So I think that my very life is an outpouring of Mr. Steele's influence from the fifth grade. And so every opportunity, though I didn't get a traditional teaching degree to be a teacher type situation, it was as, as a result of working with Gigi Howard at Ames. And after spending a couple of years in a charter school, she said, do something for yourself. So at 50, I went to school and got a degree uh, at Ohio Dominican and Columbus State or however, however it worked. And, and it was really to write a book about Mr. Steele called The Steele Influence. Yeah. So, um, so I had my own plan my whole life. And, and getting to, so getting back to the Amina house was this this one thing that you couldn't get on your own you couldn't get it on your own but it was like because these entities that come together to honor a dream a gift I get to go in there and it was like unreal and I remember not knowing how to respond it, it was it was renovated it was different it was and I remember the last conversation I had with Sydney was, how do you feel about your mother art, being an artist? And, and I remember every time, all these things were like rushing through my head. Every, everything became like, like in your face, in your face real. So is that me doing that? What now? What'd you say? Okay. Yeah, so, so every... <laughs> That was Sydney channeling through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so literally, literally, like I was, I was scared because, um, be honest, I never went in the reading room because I was only going to go with Deirdre, and she, and I wasn't, I didn't even go upstairs because I, I was saving that for another year. So I was, I was doing things bit by bit. Right. Plus, I was mad that Scott Wood showed me the house. Not mad, but he showed me the house, and I hadn't had a chance to have input on anything. So I felt like it was watching a sister die, and I couldn't be at the funeral. So. Mm -hmm. It was these things inside of you. So, but going in, it was like now all of a sudden, whatever I could be mad about, I can't be mad about because here I had this chance. So I was in a flash dream in between the first, second, or third day in the house, and it was like Mina was in the in the room where we we did a, a dinner to Sydney and Mina in the room. I had Dante to dinner with me and Sydney and Mina in our house, but um, and I had this this idea of cooking egg rolls and and trying to be healthy with her, but it was it was like. <laughs> Um, the morning I got up between going there, then going to school and trying to figure out how I was going to navigate with the grant jobs with transit arts and all the places, I had like a flash dream. And Amina was sitting at the table, just sewing with that Amina attitude. Like, cause you know, she, 
she would walk and get chicken from the store and somebody would look at her and say, you're Amina. And she'll say, yeah, the chicken's good. I mean, this is a real story that Brunel showed me about her going to, the, you know, and other people telling me how she thinks. But I, I looked at her and I said, um, cause she, she always told me, I only want things with color. If you bring me any painted paper, it has to have color. Don't bring me no white paper because she wanted color already. She didn't want to waste time right. putting color on stuff, buttons and paper right, and whatever right. you gave her. And so as she, as I was walking up from the basement, cause I had, when I got in the house, I wanted to live in every single room that was workable. And so I took all of my banners that weren't finished or needed work and hung them in the basement. And then um, the studio room was going to be the round portal pictures that I was doing. And then the living room was going to be all the little sculptures and stuff. Mm -hmm. So as I was coming upstairs, she was sewing. And I said, did you paint these gray walls? She said, no. And I was like, oh, or did you want to paint it like that? And I felt kind of like I was telling somebody this conversation I had with Amina in her house and I knew she wouldn't paint walls like that. Then I heard Deirdre say, no, she wouldn't paint them like that. Actually, you couldn't get around the house because she had right. stuff built so big right. you had to remove right. it and everything. So it's kind of like this confused feeling of, of something being real, but then not knowing if you can say what you felt was real. So you felt like you were criticizing. Mm -hmm. So it was like, it was a funny position to be in in a sense. But when it was all said and done, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> You, you, you're answering it. <laughs> okay. Okay. I just want to make sure I got there. But I think it is the, the, the wonder of being in the home and oh my walking God. through the door. Yes. Um, it's almost like stepping into a whole nother space. It was really, it really was. Yeah. So what, um, what was the first um, piece that inspired or you were inspired to create as a result of being in the house, visiting the home? And I, and I noticed in the slide too, when you talk about having dinner with Amina and Sydney, I don't know if you all saw it in the slide. He said some dinner plates and you had Amina and Sydney's names there. Yeah, uh, because uh, every time I walked in, first I was gonna just be in the studio room and work on these, these, these discs that we started when, when I worked at another school. We, we always use found things and thrown out things. And some things were, if you, if you make a piece of art from like found material or material that may not last or endure, you, as you go down the road, you figure ways to make it stronger. So you start learning how to use a stronger gel medium, or you learn how to use um, a clear coat or something, or you learn how to put fabric with it or sew it or right. mixture. So I had these round discs that were going to be just that. So I, what the first piece was one of those in there. But every day I came in, something happened. Like um, my grandmother made black dolls when we were little before there were ever such a thing or colored dolls. She took white dolls and put a color on them and gave them to people for family gifts so she was a she crocheted and knit stuff like that so um someone wanted to come by and they every day someone wanted to interview me there so I was saying yeah to it at first but then I, I see why she built those windows those because <laughs> you can't you don't have no time to make anything but right. it was cool it was neat but um I forgot what I was going to tell you okay <laughs> <laughs> what, what oh, the dolls. Fire, yeah, the dolls, the dolls yes. yes thank you <laughs> it was it was Grandma Amy. Uh, my grandmother made, she sewed, she made dolls. And Amina was, Amina, we did this little figurine for the COVID time. We made a doll out of Amina, a music box. And it was like, um, just, it was before this had really became a thing to live in the house, but it was something that was doing anyway. So um, when I worked with stuff that Amina did, it made me think of Grandma Amy. Mm -hmm. It made me feel Amy. And so while I was there, the first year we tried to get a fellowship in the grant, the house, I started showing these, we had these pumpkins from Transit Arts uh, from Joe and they would give us stuff. So we had these pumpkins. So I turned them in these faces and started making these people. And I was making stuff that, well, you know, when you show your work, you want to show, you don't know, artists don't know how to present work for a grant. We don't know how to do it. We just <laughs> right. present what we think makes things work and we do all the stuff. You need somebody to step in and help you with that. But right. I was making work that, is that Aaron? Hey, Aaron. <laughs> so to get back to it was grandma amy it was it was it was that and and the reason why i'm excited about aaron i would like you to know um that piece over there was a lithograph that amina gave me that um, one there right yes here? yes okay. and and that piece is for aaron i want i want people to meet aaron today okay if we get a chance and i see he made it here um but it, it's the first piece we did dedicated to sydney it's, it's a collaboration it was a black and white lithograph that amina has so i had the original at home um, I put color in it and then Aaron painted the side with his family. Mm. And so that's when it's going to be for him. And we made 15 of those 
One stays at the Amina house and um, a few people have brought them. And those are, those are what we've done. That was the very first piece to get back to your question. Wow. That was the very first wow. piece. We I had this lithograph that Amina gave to me. Mm -hmm. It's black and white. It's been in my house ever since I talked to Sydney. And mm -hmm. so it's like been here, it's been there and it's been lost, it's been found. And so when I got the official word that I was gonna be here at the house, I was speechless. I was, I didn't know how to respond. I, I couldn't believe it. It was surreal. Like, so I grabbed that and then I would, I added color to it and painted, actually painted it and made it fit a 15 by 11. And to ask Aaron at school, he's, he's, a, he's a student at Whitehall High School. He's in an art class we teach weekly. Um, he, he's a natural intuitive artist. Um, when they, when I was working with him, I, he started painting people and he said, it's my family. Yeah. And so when we did a show called Brothers, he was in our show. That was the first show we did after COVID. So um, I'm really excited he was able to make this because I, I, I think Aaron, Aaron's going to be famous. <laughs> Claim it. <laughs> so I want to talk about um, when you talk about Sydney because you, 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 you mentioned him and your conversations with him. Um, and that's part of the reason we're having this talk because you and I had a conversation and um, Sydney is a, a critical component to a lot of her work. Yeah. Um, and particularly men, yes. black men, her father, her uncle, all these other men in black community. And, um, and it also makes me think of um, um, Mary and Joseph. I know you say, well, what does that have to do with what we were talking about? Because in the biblical story, um, we see the story of conception of Mary for Jesus to be born. And I'm always, I was always curious of why did Joseph's story drop out? Like it just ended. Like we hear no more from Joseph wow. or about Joseph. And I think about that a lot about black men and fathers when people always say absent men and absent fathers and how we don't hear these stories. But Amina was very intentional and you are intentional about keeping Sydney's story <laughs> relevant. Why do you think that's important? Well, it's really kind of hard not to tear up on this one because Dante said it in the video um, or when COVID happened and so, Sometimes when I'm in a high school with kids, they'll say raunchy things and say rude things, but I act like it's nothing new. And, or I'll say, when they're gonna beat somebody or do something, I'll say, well, what, so after you do that, what's next? So I kind of like, kind of put it in a category of like, I'm not shocked, mm -hmm. but I do know you're doing it because you don't feel heard. I mean, I don't say that, but I know that. So I can, I can hear the other side that you, you can give me because that one, you don't need to do that one with me. I, I know the other you is there. Mm -hmm. So um, when I went to Mina's house and I saw Sydney, uh, I saw this guy, he was like sitting in the shadow, like he was sitting in the shadow. But, and I was this clumsy kid because since my mom and I had no relationship or not one that was like, my, my reason for coming here was to, to, to make art buy happiness and find my mom, you know, find a dad. And um, so when I saw Sydney, uh, I said, well, how do you feel about your mother being an artist? He goes, and he looked at me like, um, not, and I don't even think he knew what to say. So uh, later, uh, when I found out he took his life, which uh, I, I thought about how, or not even that, when we would see each other in public all the time, she would say, how's your family? Because she knew my wife, she knew my children. And some of the pictures that was taken of her was by my little daughter and uh, April, and April, April has what you call special needs. So sometimes she's angry and all those things or feels invisible and, or do things that gets dangerous. And yeah. so uh, I'm just saying that stuff because we all have those sides to us that we don't talk about or maybe don't know how to talk about or how to address. Yeah. But um, the Sydney part was every time I saw Amina, she would say, hi, it's the family. And I was skinny when we first met each other back in the, in the first time. But uh, when they had the arts festival uh, by CCAD and she walked out and she walked past me and I looked at her, but I didn't say anything because, you know, she had got all this notice and everybody was Amina, 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 and, you know? And so like, you know, you, you try to let people like that come to you and don't really like over space them in my head. So she said, Durat, 
<laughs> and she said, I, re I heard all the good things you're doing in the paper. And I was kind of, you know, and we had had trans stars perform here that day. And she talked a little bit and she, that was that. And we said whatever we said, but she knew who I was and I knew who she was, but I never could say, she said, how's your family? How's this? And I never said, how's Sydney? I couldn't say anything about Sydney. I couldn't even address Sydney. Mm. I couldn't finish the dialogue. I didn't know where to go with it. Mm. Um, mm. So when you say getting in the house, what is it do? It gave me one chance that I never dreamed was happening because I kind of say to people, the best gifts really aren't in the banks, in the museums, they're in a the graveyard, unwritten, unsung, ungiven. So Sydney was a gift. And however, and the Sydney's across the world are gifts. The people we hear about being killed are gifts mm. somewhere along the line. And there is eternal, uh, eternal realm. So even in time, if your realm of life isn't as beautiful as you would like it to be, I believe the hope for a better one is what I hold on to. And so that's what you find a resilience in her work and you find it in work that is resilient. And that's what we crave. We crave what resilience is. And so um, I met a guy when I got my governor's award, a white guy, um, but, but, but if I could say this, he was white, I was black or brown or however you wanna call us. But we were speaking not from that place, we spoke from nations. And he was talking about the guy it's from a part of Africa where he had no sound, no water, no this, no that, but he plays 11 instruments. Uh, he's teaching around the world and he comes and does all this stuff without any kind of whatever. And uh, so we, so when he started telling me the story, I recorded it, but then our friendship without even knowing his name or my name became such a strong thing about resilience because the idea of resilience is, it seems like you can have everything, schools, libraries, galleries, and still be at a loss for making things, or you can have nothing and create things we've never seen. So it's like somewhere in that bridge, I desire, I don't know what I'm saying, but that's what I, yeah. I, I long for. No, no, that's important. So do so would you consider, because you and I talked about culture carriers and part of your work is about culture carriers. Is Sydney in that lineage and then how do you, and what do you mean by culture carrier? So the audience can understand what that means in okay. relationship to art. So the, the way things make sense to me is. And does someone have any tissue? Oh, you need tissue? Yeah, well, I'm give you oh, tissue. no, I'm good. <laughs> um, no, no, no. Uh, so the question was, when I was younger, trying to find a job, where is black leadership? Where is black leadership over and over? And you know, that's when you used to read your horoscope, look for a job. You know, I'm, I'm 12, <laughs> I'm looking for a job, reading my horoscope. And Today's trying to not find, a good day to look for a job. <laughs> I'm trying to find black leadership, you know, after whoever there's not, there's there. And, and you know, I had the fifth grade teacher, but after that was, I had another lady, Miss Knowles. She was a white lady with blue hair and she used to sing all the time and I loved her, but she wasn't black leadership, but I still couldn't find it. And so, so when I was painting somewhere in my heart, I was trying to paint black leadership. Mm. And so when I get to the Sydney start and I talk, I start talking about where gifts are and aren't. Um, at, working at the teen center, going places where I saw people like me, it, it was like when I see kids walking down the street with a hood on walking, my curiosity was how to get them to turn around and look back at us. Mm -hmm. So that was my um, calling as an artist. And, and after the LA riots happened, Rodney King was beat and da 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 da. And, and it was on TV and it's all over the news. And the thing that stood out there was about the, guy, the white guy, Reginald Denny. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and uh, a little old lady, black lady, she, oh, Dietrich, thank you. She, she was involved. And she literally, when they pulled him out of the truck and they were beating him, she literally walked out in the crowd and said, yeah. stop beating the man. Yeah. So I asked God, how do I respond to the LA riots? And how do I respond to this? He's, and it was, the question was comfort my humanity. And it was like, that's, that's where this all comes from. So it's kind of like that. So I always saw this work. This is how I comfort humanity. I, I, that's what the work was about. That's, that was simply it. And so there's somewhere in there Sydney wasn't addressed and couldn't mm -hmm. be addressed. Right. And he's he's part of the humanity that needs to be comfort. And he's he's a representation of a whole part of humanity, not just though he's that son of the lady that we talk about and forget about. Right. She wouldn't want her son forgotten. Right. And so, well, anyway, I assume that. And um, and I also feel camaraderie because 
not knowing my father. Um, one, of, one of my brother's fathers was Clarence. And so his father was Clarence. And as I see pictures of him, I feel like I look in my, I look in his face and take liberties to say like, if, if I was around Sydney, maybe we could have built this relationship where I take him for a hamburger and we look at the girls and whistle, or <laughs> we may say a cuss word and, and, and repent. Um, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> again and again and again. Uh, right. May talk about how afraid I am about life and what it's like to be a bastard, you know, and then find, find that hugging in the middle of it. In our weakness, we find strength. And in our weakness, we find strength. And I'll say it again in our weakness, we find strength. Yeah. So, um, that place of being vulnerable is so valuable. Um, the place to let go, the place to go tell someone, though my husband is good here, he's insecure here. And so I don't know how I'm gonna make it, but I keep trying to hold on or vice versa or whatever you wanna find, but you're just someone you wanna to talk to about it. Not really that, you're not looking for an answer. Right. Uh, and so we find, we find resilience in that. Like we find, so the Sydney thing was just this opportunity for me to feel like I addressed something I couldn't address and, and on uh, that, and then understand that um, the idea of carrying culture became these face, these, these are toilet paper rolls and during um, COVID of course, toilet paper was expensive. So if, a, if it costs <laughs> that much, the roll has to be worth something. <laughs> so we took them to the students and made art out of them. We made faces out of them. We, went along and found people doing them. So I, of course I had to make it my own way. And this lady brought out, take one out and show you. She brought, I, I wasn't gonna give him one, Mr. Terrence, Dr. Terrence Dean one because he's carrying culture. On the bottom it has my young Duart. I signed things with young Duart and it's I found this little thing but it's actually a toilet paper roll carved out. And inside of it, it's a, it's a gourd that, that has an actual seed in it. And, wow. and you think about the gourds that came from Africa, the seeds yeah. that came from the bottom of ships, this, the fruit that was sown in the hair. You think yeah. about all the history of sla slavery and how seeds were carried mm -hmm. and, and the seed of faith, the seed of hope, the seed of life, the seed of everything, the seed of the sun. There's the slaves that, you know, carried seeds. So um, this was a face carved out. And instead of it being a mass, it's called a culture carrier, a seed carrier. Mm -hmm. And so when we sat in the Mina house, Dante and I, Dante Woods over there, he's, we, we decided to document each other's lives. And when I first met him, he didn't think he was an artist, but the Trayvon Martin thing had happened. And uh, we did a show called Force Perceptions. Mm -hmm. And I always see this picture of a guy with locks passing the brush to the next generation uh, instead of the blunt, you know, because I, when I hung around the kids, they was always like, pass the blunt, pass the blunt. Mm -hmm. So I thought if I say pass the brush and put the blunt down, it, was, it would represent a skill it represent some kind of like order, some kind of maturity or some kind of place of, of honor. And so the brush was the torch for culture and the torch of this guy with locks flowing in the wind and he was standing there and he was leading the way for the next generation. So, so Dante's become, he was in church, I prayed for someone that could carry the torch to the younger generation or the next generation mm. as we age out and connect to someone that could see what the vision was. And I told him who he was and he looked at me like I was a fool. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of the kids that he knew got murdered. And so I painted a picture and he took it to the family. And we had heard that they were shooting at the funeral and his phone died and he didn't call us. So we didn't know if he got killed or not. Mm. And he dropped in at Transit Arts. And of course we were excited to see him now this is going to sound rude because we, I said that little short monkey came in the room, <laughs> but this is really out of our own love. I'm not, please forgive me if you think I'm racist, no. but it was just this thing because Dante, he, he mocks me all the time, <laughs> but he walked in and I was so glad to see that monkey. I mean, in the sense of we hugged each other we went to dinner. I think Kat was there too. We all like, we couldn't believe it. We had tear gas to place, but he carried this picture of, uh, the guy that was killed son sitting on the shoulder of his uncle and we made the shirt called raise our sons don't kill them get don't get even so it's kind of like we've been behind the scenes doing these things and so he's become the, the subject of so many things the paintings were purposefully targeted at people with the idea of some kind of hope 
So this is what I mean by seed carrier. Right. So when I brought this for you, I wanted to make sure that you get one of these and you, because I, I feel like rarely have, do I have a chance to um, spend time with black men and talk about mm. carrying and pass for, passing forth culture. Actually, there's other people in the room that I, I did Tears of a King at Sean Christopher Gallery and he gave me a chance to, to do it. And the Tears of the King was representing the father who cried because his kids were broken. Mm. And all those faces were in it. So every, every show has a sequential buildup of the desire of a father's heart. To, mm. The first one was drums to guns, you know, and it, you know, the people taken from a land or, or sold from a land and go to a place where they total sin and they no longer carry the, the drums, but they carry guns. So the old guy cries because his kids are carrying guns. So it's like everything's been about the healing of a people. So the seed carrier is the carrier forth of culture. It is not in a poverty way, but in a way of a honor. Yeah. So when I was in a house, it became real. When Coach Keith Neal came in, well, first Malik, my sister's kids came uh, and I, I wanted to put something in their hands that talked about the Willoughby Solvich business. And so I feel like I'm talking way too long. No, it's, fine. it's okay. And so like the, the, I told them to pick one and I began to see then this was a fir affirmation of the seed carry in honor of Sydney. So right. Sydney started something and eventually we'll have an official seed carry and ceremony with other, other people that we took pictures of and gave the seeds already or the, the piece to is that they're carrying culture, they're carrying leadership, yeah. and they're, they're going to fill in the gap. And we're calling out their gifts. We're calling out who you are. And we're going to acknowledge this. Even if you can't see it, if it's not real, it is real. Yeah. So it's like, um, and I believe that in honor of Sydney, we can, every time you have a loss or what you call something that's a blow, it gives you the resilience to rise up and take yeah. that same thing and look back at it and use it as a platform to live off of and not die under. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that's really what, Every time you make a, I make a piece of art, it's not really make a piece of art. It's like taking, taking life back. It's taking, taking a dream and, and examining it. It's taking this idea of like, what are we here for? Yeah. We're here for this. Yeah. So if, if I can find out who Mudfoot is, a guy who went to East High School because another guy knew him, knew he knew Amina and then he went to a party, I find out that we really stand on Mudfoot's shoulders. And so we, then we find out when I paint this picture of Mudfoot, it turns out somebody else, Derek Cole knows him and, He's somebody else's family member. And, and in real life, I'm telling a real story that just happened this summer that, that we're so connected that, that every time we do something with honor, it pulls somebody else into the picture and the yarn that went around, that goes around in the biblical cord that's cut from the yarn, that the whole thing of life has this connectedness so, so deep that we don't even understand until we're in the midst of, we're at a funeral, then you're always, or we're at this dinner or we're at this wedding or we're at this place that we're so connected to that thing that we just are. And it's like, I, I feel like God has allowed me to, as a biracial kid, to single out what's happened to black people or people of color in some way. But sometimes I, 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 it doesn't matter when you're talking to a person, I'm in a school with white kids who are just as broken or any other kid, when you see kids that don't come, that come from other countries, every time you look at their face and you start seeing what their gift is, and when you talk a little bit more, they come back and give you a little more. Then they sit around, you don't know where to go and you don't know where to go because the vulnerability creates this closeness that you're not used to, even me as an adult. And then you're, they're there. So you, now you stop working because you're looking at them. Now they're telling you telling you things, yeah. Because I, I, I tell some kids, you walk like a prince. And I told this guy when we went to Governor's Awards, you're gonna be the only black kid going. He says, I'm Sudanese. And he's this tall prince looking guy. And he goes, I was like, wow, my son said he's not raising his kids as black and white children. He's raising them as nationalities. Mm -hmm. So they're nations. And so I decided we put flags on, on these cards and ask kids where they're from. And, and then Modu was from Gambia. And, uh, and I started talking to these kids. And so I talked to the kid one more time because people think he's an undercover cop because he's so mature. He's at the high school and, and, or something. Because like, he just walks around like, how you doing? He does his work. <laughs> but he said... He said, okay, let me tell you the truth. I was as eighth grade, real bad kid, clumsy. I looked in the mirror and taught myself how to talk. And he said, he said, you're the first person that figured that out. He said, I want to do better with my life. So I'm just saying, these are the things that I get a chance to sit in school and see happen. And it just, just happened. So it's like, and, and I'm sorry, I feel like I'm talking way too much. <laughs> <laughs> this is great because these are all stories, but it's also about telling us more about the necessity of culture carriers and the necessity of 
each of us and how we are essentially playing a part in how we are producing and creating with one another um, to share our gifts and talents, but also have us to recognize who we are, recognize the other and see the other. The children are our future. That's so lovely. That's definitely lovely. Need, so, yeah. Yeah. So I, I get a chance to do that in, in the high school. So kids come in and out and I look for the opportunity just to like grab that. Yeah. Call it out. Yeah. Look in your face. Look back in my face and get awkward, nervous yeah. sometimes because when people really connect to you, it's a little bit scary because now you don't know what to do. It's like this honor that's bigger than yeah. life. So it's kind of like every chance I get to do that, I get to to. So the question I could have asked Sydney. So Sydney, what do you dream? Is yeah. like what I could have asked him, but I I wasn't ready. So sometimes our mistakes help us get ready. So it's like, I don't have to regret that I didn't do it. I, I just take the opportunity now to, yeah. to look at someone and say, so what do you dream? Or how did you get here? Or, and then you begin to understand. And then what, what was so cool, um, when you start having these conversations with people, it creates other people in a room to want. And really the, the very first kid that came back to school from jail or something, and he came to me, he said, or he came, I said, well, how did you turn around and get mature. Cause everybody said last year he was cussing teachers out. He was doing things. He said, well, he went to jail. He read a book he can change and he tried to change. So what I'm saying is when you see someone that still fails, but tries to change, if you really acknowledge that little bit of change or that little bit of whatever, even if they keep failing forever, that one acknowledgement of what you are or what I see you trying to be kind of has a lasting impact. So it's, 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 it's that place. So it's almost like a full circle for you because you do get to come back to Sydney, yeah. even though you didn't feel like there was closure. Here you have the opportunity to, as a fellow, to come back. As a fellow, yes. Yeah, to, to yeah. visit Sydney and yeah. to close that chapter. Yes. So this is beautiful. Um, so we want to see the images that you did create um, from, so I think you had the slides from those images that you were able to create. And then you can just take us through okay. each um, image. Um, because these are very powerful and beautiful images. Okay. All right. Um, so I, I guess I don't know if you can read all that, but it just simply, this is a series that illustrates my ability to respect and respect for Amina and Sydney. You know, it's all written right there. So hopefully you can read that, um, give you a chance to read that. And it's like the benefit of life, a gift to us all. So these, these are pieces that I was starting and working on all along. I was documenting Amina and right. uh, it gave me a chance to, so I knew that, if I ever get to be in a house, I would take the chance to have focal point on these, this series of her evolution and, and narrate. So the first slide, I guess he told me to push this button. Let me see. <laughs> Let me see. Go right. Yeah, I think that's the first creative one. Creative Origins. Yeah, Creative Origins. Yeah, that's, um, so the first time I ever met Amina was at uh, Walnut Ridge High School, and it was a Black History show. And if you, you can't really see on the bottom, but Kojo, Barbara Chavis, and other artists were part of that whole event. And it was at Walnut Ridge High School and I did screen printing. So as a young person, that's where I was. And it's two pictures of her there. The side view of her face was when um, I visited her house with Larry Wilson and that's when I met Sydney in the eighties. So those pictures go back to then. Um, the next picture, um, I'm going the right way. Yeah, it's bigger than life. And it just shows the scope of how she took on a project and she was in the zone. And like, I think the, the, uh, the long piece is what she was working on a piece for Elijah Pierce's book. She would do these long things. When I say things, that's not the right word. <laughs> these long pieces that went on and was bigger than her and just sewed more on. The other one is the chair. I think that was, I don't know the name of the chair, but um, I think it has Elijah Pierce or he was around that chair. So that's that big, she was bigger than life or her work was bigger than life in that sense. Then the second one, the next one is, um, so right here, um, I call it uh, the Leonardo da Vinci effect because she had a love for him. Wow. And if you look at the art in the background, you'll see Aaron's work. Aaron, do you see your work in that picture? Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Aaron hasn't seen his that. What's name over there? Yeah, so Aaron, <laughs> that's his family and his friends. And so the ones with the black around them, those are mine. So I, I actually buy art from kids and learn how to um, draw that way. So I have a whole book of kids art that I try to copy or emulate. <laughs> Okay, the, the next one is, this is called Seed Carrier and Cultural Warriors. It was a guy named, um, oh, I can't think of his name. I can see his face. He did the fetishes. He teaches in Texas. He's an artist from Columbus. He's 
And he's, he called me a cultural warrior one day. He said that that's how I've always been a cultural warrior. And I, I kept that thing. So I gave it to me and Amina. And this is the very last time that I got to see Amina. It was at the Hammond, well, this was the last, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was at the Hammond Hawkins Gallery in Bexley before it moved. Uh -huh. And that, that, was, that was a picture. Um, I think Kat or Dante took of me with her. So that was us. And, and you would see in that picture is, is us standing in front of our works. Mine's where it's Company Humanity. And she traded me a piece from 1990, wow. 78 that I have at home. Uh, so that's, that's what that is. The next one, this one, this is called Bloodline. That's, that's uh, yeah, Sydney. Oh yeah, next side, thank you. <laughs> I'm looking at the little one here, my cheat sheet. So uh, Shelby, P. Shelby is a girl in the city who loves Amina. And she says, Amina's her teacher. She did this button, collage, this button picture that I turned into a piece of art. Uh, if you if you know about Sydney, he loved the dandelion. He loved how it grew back. He loved, she read a book about that to him. And you see, to be a drum, if you look like the cottons filled the dandelions in that book, if you look back at that book again, you'll see it. And that's this picture that I drew that has a feeling of Sydney when he was a kid with the hands on it. And I and it all just kind of came together. And so that was the the bloodline. The next piece is called Amina's Window. Um, Urban Strings, uh, they asked me to do a piece uh, with uh, Mark Lomax. And so this piece was done for them to take around when they, they uh, perform. And it really has Amina and Sydney in the background. You can kind of see them kind of, it was like this idea of them reuniting and the culture and a little bit of books. I didn't. So I'll say something, this is gonna sound flawed, but um, since we were in church or this particular church or a group of people, everything about art was like sacrilege or bad, you know, or not good. So I didn't study anybody. I never studied Leonardo. I didn't look at nobody because I didn't wanna to go to hell. And uh, so <laughs> please forgive me for telling you that out loud. I should have kept it to myself maybe, but, but when I got to the house, we got to bring some of the other artists like Dante, or I mean, uh, Joe Cross and other kids. They, so while I was at the Mina's house, we would paint in the studio. And, and near the week, oh my God, we was leaving at three o'clock in the morning, you know, and I still had to get up at seven and go work with the other kids. But Joe Cross sat there and started talking about Leonardo da Vinci and, 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 and Mina's books were there. And, and then, I, then I finally went and watched my first video of Mina and found out that she was out with Leonardo and she would talk about him like it was her boyfriend. And, uh, or she would, if you watch the videos, you'll know what I mean. And I started really being like, then that final week I went home and started watching everything I could about everybody. I just went nuts, like really obsessively looking at every artist that I didn't look at because I was afraid to look at. This is crazy to tell you out loud. I feel like I'm saying something that's sacrilegious, but um, I begin to realize the, uh, the effect of other artists that are carrying culture. So the the idea of us all, we're all carrying parts of the culture of humanity. And so it's, it could be black culture, it could be Indian culture, it could be any culture. I mean, but, but we're all culture carriers. Mm -hmm. So the target of, of, of the seed carriers in, in light of Sydney is, is, is to honor yeah. the bloodline there. And, and Amina's window, she gave us a window of time to, to enjoy who she is and was, and she's part of the canon. And so I make her the East Side canon and whatever the canon. And so now we come to Trust the process. The piece over there on the floor, it's, yeah, it's, oh, it's turn the next seat. Yeah, that right there. So um, when I got the money, the first thing I did was I made 15 canvas prints of this. And one was to be at the house for Sydney. And the day we want to give that one to Aaron. And, um, uh, and, and we, um, a few of them sold. And so that's, um, the idea of trusting your process, period. And, and, and I really didn't name it trust the process, but it got named that by accident. And so I'm sticking with it. Um, it's funny uh, the way titles come and names come. And it was the process of working with Aaron and the process of even him coming tonight. I'm really honored because I feel like, I just feel like Sydney's here with this. Um, uh, the next one is uh, the piece, uh, Sydney, where I've spelled his name, huh? Oh yeah, yeah. So this is, so what, I, so what I do sometimes, I'll take the work and make smaller versions and make other versions. And this piece right here was made because they're gonna do something at the Good House, 
a show with nine pieces and these pieces went to the good house. So in time for our talk, I put them together sequentially so right. they could make sense. And so that, um, and, and then, and if you look, Sydney's name is spelled right and Amina's name is spelled right because <laughs> I'm good at spelling things different every time. <laughs> so I'll warn you ahead of time. Some people like my misspelled work, but not everybody. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. It's really an honor. And if, if this little piece up here, um, it's wispy. It's, it's like the angelic realm is around and um, he's, he's full of joy. And, uh, and that's, that's what that is. And the St. Coco bird you talked about earlier. Yeah, so uh, and the, ones, the little one you see right here, you don't see, if you look close, those are Sankofa birds. Like it's like two of them right, or three of them around here. And then you'll see some coming through her hand and through their arms. Yeah. I had one in his head where his head looks like a sun, red sun, but it, it it didn't look right. So, of course, you know when you get a chance to show stuff, you spend five or six hours looking at it and changing it. Yeah. So anyway, um, that's where we are, and then we come to this pace right here. Seven ninety one to give. Mm. And it's uh, 791 is the number of the house, but I just left the street off. For those who ever go there, you'll know what that means. And it's just like some ways you want to protect the gift. It's at 791 and, and her whole thing. When you, so, so since I didn't watch any of Mina's videos, um, it, it gets to this place where you're not always ready. Like if you lose a loved one, you're not ready to throw away the clothes or go right. in a room yet. Then mm -hmm. when you finally walk in, open a letter you didn't get or something like that. Um, being in the house, cooking in it, cleaning in it, meeting people and coming through it and watching the video, you realize Amina kept saying, you'll know, you're all gonna get it back. Everything she did was a gift for us. Mm -hmm. And so she knew, she knew we would get it. She knew we would look at it. And then I could run across lots of teachers who say that they had a hand in helping her or coming to her and knowing about the dream of the gift before it was. Mm -hmm. The craziest thing on earth is, when I say the craziest thing on earth, when I first became an artist going to art shows, meeting Betty Stahl, going around places, uh, Miss Deirdre, she had a gallery called Peaceworks way back then. And um, I started taking pictures with a camera because I was building scrapbooks of my family members. I was seeing people as family. I didn't think I'd ever be living in Amina's house or considered this kind of an artist, but I always knew that this was how I was gonna tell a story of my family that I found. And uh, a guy named Smokey Brown passed away. He, was, he took me around and showed me things, treated me like a father or, you know, a grandfather. And, you know, he had art that was questionable for the church. And I remember telling Miss Betty, I said, is he going to have that art here when the church people come? Because they might not like that. <laughs> she said, well, like it or not, this is real art. And they're going to have to get over it. And uh, so I, I'm just saying, uh, so I was baptized through Smokey and literally uh, Smokey died. and. Three years ago, just before COVID hit, his wife, Laverne, after 15 years, gives me an inheritance of work, Smokies, which had one of Amina's pieces in it. And it's just like, and if you hear in a video, she starts naming Smokey Brown and Roman Johnson and all these people. And she talks about everybody as a family and as a collective and as a walker. And it was very like, so anyway, it, it's really the gift. So that's where it stops there. Wow. Well, I want to say that you truly are a gift. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is amazing. Um, I know Deidre is here. So we want to take some questions from the audience um, before we wrap up. Um, if anyone have any questions, please, and we'll get to you. We have the mic here. So everyone raise your hand. So much. Can you hear me? Okay. I just want to say thank you so much, both of you. This has been this just the most informative, the most warm, empathetic honor and um, I know Amina is smiling, let me just say that. And Sydney, let yeah, me just say yeah, that. Yeah. I would like to take questions from the audience and we're also on Zoom today. So if there are questions on Zoom, we can take those as well. And Mark Zuzik is here to assist us with the Zoom questions. Anyone from the audience? My sister, Jocelyn. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for your vulnerability. Yes. Um, I need that in my life. I need people to be real. And thank you for doing that. Having lived with this entire journey of Didi's, Deidre's, uh, <laughs> um, through the whole Amina project, I am 
probably more intimidated by her work than getting comfortable with it. She was a genius. How do you approach living in her home, taking, this is for both of you, taking responsibility for uh, informing people about her life and her work, wanting to get it right? Or do you feel that she's sort of giving you permission to just be comfortable and share it as you want to share it. I mean, what is, how, but for both of you. Actually, uh, um, first of all, it's, it's quite, quite a privilege and it is overwhelmingly like, you don't want to get it wrong. Yeah. Like I told him yesterday, I, I was careful. I didn't want to say a lot of things that I really felt inside. And even while I'm talking, I'm thinking, boy, I'm probably making these people feel like, can he move on? You know, like, um, but um, I feel both of what you said. I feel the honor, the weight, and I also feel the, the freedom because when um, I thought I was going to offend Deirdre when I said she wouldn't have painted these walls like this because I was one of those moments my sister said when they did my mother's eulogy, my sister's very like expressive, outwardly angry, emotional. And she said, they're not talking about my m and and mom, you know, just like my mom used to talk to us. And uh they were at the funeral trying to say the best they could. They didn't know mommy, but, but they, didn't, they couldn't get it. Like nobody could say anything right. So I'm just saying it to say somewhere along the line when I was scared that Deirdre was going to say, well, you gave you a grant. You're going to talk bad about us. But she never said it. She said, no, she wouldn't have wanted this like this. We did this because we needed to make it work. So anyway, I mean, and, and let me just say one more thing. I was so geeked to be here with him today because uh, – he, I got to meet him on the phone and he has this honor. And I was telling, I was, I'm really, really, really thankful like to see how he took the words that could hear what I was trying to say. And when he said that we fall apart as, as a whole, I was like, man, this is brilliant. And um, I'm just trying to tell you, uh, I don't know how else. So you get a privilege to work with someone that's an in-resident scholar. Wow, thank you, Lord. You know, what can I say? Thank you, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we do have a question from Zoom um, from Lori Wallace. She'd like to know what helps you continually find inspiration and motivation? Uh, you, forgiveness, one, forgiveness. Bitterness, uh, George Washington Carver, could have been bitter his whole life, but he, he revolutionized the comedy of the South. He, he was castrated. He was everything that could happen to a man could happen. Uh, he, he was offered jobs to be here and there. He looked at the plants and he found what they were made for. He, he questioned God about everything and, he, and then God gave him the ability to, to take the things that were for him to question and question them. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the honor of men and kings to search it out, searching out what makes life tick. Hearing an elder say she's a grandma raising a granddaughter, those are the honor, those honors. Amita said, I lived a humble life. Uh, when people say, I want to move out of Whitehall and get in a better neighborhood, going to a better neighborhood could, could become that worst neighborhood without a vision. So finding someone that comes from Virgin Islands and cares about his whole family. And, and I, I go to kids, young people that may not have got a Fort Hayes, but they got skills inside of them. They, they didn't know not to use black and they take the color black and paint it in ways you never would imagine. I'm talking about a kid named Malik that's, that I work with. He's my youth assistant, but um, he's the one to help me move everything in and out of the house. The kids came in there and they helped me clean spots off the floor and wall to make sure I didn't get in trouble. They, they, <laughs> they drove my car and told me how to pack it. So I work with kids and there's a benefit that comes with that. They, they help you. There's inspiration there because they can be resilient when you're feeling like you're too old to walk, you know, or your legs don't work out. And I, I say the inspiration comes from that. Or like, I'll just take this minute to share this since that person asked the question to this. This right here was an old, like, music box. Japanese and during the COVID, it's a and she made wind up things. So I started going to thrift stores and finding music boxes and 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 made an amina. So oh, wow. I just wanted you to see that. 
and everything kind of comes together and it's, it plays way down on the Swanee River. So <laughs> there's dreams inside of all of us. Look for the dream in a person. Um, ironically, when I didn't know how to stand this on, I just took an old reel and cut it out like Amina would and got some fabric and do what she would do. T take what you got in front of you and use it. Don't think you don't have supplies. This was the library, what they did her mural years ago. This was in my mom, wife's box. It says 2016 or something. This is a puzzle they gave away, but her work was there. That's where my daughter took the picture of it. So after all these years, this and this has come together in a box. So, it, so it's like, if you keep moving forward, you'll find you're on a path and then everything that you do connects like that ball of yarn that unravels and it goes in and out and out and in. And, you know, and that's really what, where, how we find inspiration and take every opportunity to, to make a mistake and fail and get up from it. Someone told me, my nephew Malik said, a teacher told him that your problems are insurmountable because he got a girl pregnant back in New Jersey. And he wrote this poem that they never gave him back. And at the end of it, it said something like, if you have will, get up. Just get up. There was a time in my life I used to cry because I didn't want to go to school. I was depressed. Um, I didn't have the strength to kill myself because I was scared to die. I'm not, and it's not funny. It's really serious. But um, I would watch Lucille Ball and want a family and watch the Brady Bunch and thought I could get rich and buy happiness. And then I finally decided not to land. This is going to sound brash. Not to lay in those pissy, stinking sheets. I got up. And I never went back to sheets again. And I'm just saying it to say, uh, like literally, I wish I could say everything was easy, but it really wasn't. It's a choice to get up. Mm. So you find inspiration by getting up, uh, failing, mm. um, being oddballs, taking a risk, making a mistake by telling somebody you care about them and them not knowing how to respond. So, man, I feel like I'm talking way too much. <laughs> never, never, never. We have another question here. Hi, I don't have a question, but I want to thank you because um, once a week I drive down Main, East Main Street and there's a building that has had many uses over the years. But when you were talking about the seeds, it's um, the saying is something along the lines of um, they thought they could bury us but they didn't, didn't realize we were, we were seeds. seeds. Yes. And <laughs> that is one of my favorite parts of the week when I drive by there wow. every Tuesday morning. <laughs> That's important. And this yeah. goes exactly to what you're talking about. Yeah. And I know that when I work with kids, that's always what I'm thinking. If nothing else, I'm planting seeds. So thank you. I wow. really appreciate thank you. you. That's, that's really important. Thank you so much. I'm glad the mic came on this side of the room. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both. It really Thank is a you. treat for um, me to be here today. But it kept coming to me to ask the question, Duarte, do you listen to music and what do you listen to? Of course. Um, it's a wide range of everything. Um, <laughs> so I, I love church. I love Aretha Franklin. I love Donna Hathaway. I like um, any kind of thing that says something vulnerable. Uh, those are people that I just happened to play, my son gave me I, you, uh, iTunes so you can play everything. And I put the Bluetooth on at the house and I would crank Aretha Franklin's jazz album that people don't know she even did. And she would sing these songs. And for some reason, the, the, the way her mouth sounded like an instrument, you would hear these songs. Or the Five Blind Boys of Atlanta, I mean, Alabama. Uh, that's when I found out Dante's aunt used to play these these songs so i'm in there playing the stuff or nikki giovanni's stuff when she talked about langston hughes and uh nina simone and these kind of people uh uh it is well with my soul like just things like that like the spirituals that was sung you know with her album um on and on uh adele whoever uh tracy chapman just i mean it's just like whoever can sing and tell the truth in a song i'll play them and i'll play them until i can't play them no more and then every now and again I'll go find these South African things singing about the world can wait. And, and some of my pictures are filled with all that. That's th those elements. Um, sometimes it's just uh, the, 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 the Mills brothers that sing simple music. Actually, I get a chance to do a mural on the Mills brothers. I was telling him about it in Bell Fountain. And, and I get to meet some of the descendants of them. They're here from Ohio. And they lived in a time when it was really like a time out of a joint. And they sung before the queen. 
Um, and actually, Catherine Willis knows about them. Um, and so we have we have this whole line of people that that are connected to this yarn that we're all living in. And so, oh my God, I can't believe I got a chance to actually just be a part of this. You know, um, yeah, everything that you know, I, I, I like sometimes when I when someone say, "What do you find inspiration?" I'll look at American Idol or those shows where the people go on there and and they start one chance to sing and they belt out a song and they have the story they overcame. You know, I just look at it over and over like like I'm addicted or something because I, sometimes it feels like I'm because you just see a dream and you just you cry with them you you rejoice with them you you know it's like there's a time when you know what I mean like we we, we bear together there's a season for everything there's a time for mourning and rejoicing and all that but the one thing I was talking about when the guy told me about the guy that lived in Africa that made he could play eleven instruments he made instruments out of anything they knew how to sing and dance. They knew how to, they sang and danced so they didn't hurt. And the hurt may be still there, but you learn to sing and dance. And it's not that, that my Angela, the first book I ever wrote when I read, when I didn't know how to read was, uh, I knew why the cage bird sings. My conclusion to that is it has to, we have to sing, we have to paint, we have to love the next child, we have to do it because we can't not do it. If we didn't do it, we'd lose our direction. And that's the idea of returning to our, our roots or our culture. <laughs> Thank you for that question. I think I want Do Art's um, play, playlist. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a great playlist. Do we have another question from Zoom? No more questions? Anybody else? Any questions in the room? Is that Aaron's hand up there? Aaron's hand is up. We have a hand over here. I'll come right back to you, Aaron, OK? <laughs> I'd like to add something about Dwart's resume and Dwart as a person. Um, in 1996, I decided I was going to start a charter school. And I'm sure he said to himself, because he told me, well, I can't help you. I work all during the day. And, but he did help me. And I'm sure he thought I was an old, crazy, fat white woman. But, <laughs> uh, not really. And so I asked him to be the first art teacher at this high school. And then he looked at me and he said, I think I didn't graduate high school. I didn't go to college. I went through ninth grade. And I looked at him and I said, I don't care. <laughs> Who would you rather have as a mentor for your children than this wonderful person? And oh, you have no idea how wonderful. Anyway. He was our first art teacher, and they wow. changed the rules for charter schools. When we opened, your teachers had to be qualified, not necessarily certified. And who would be more qualified to <laughs> teach a school where they're mostly Black children than this person? At the time, I was teaching a class where there were 31 third graders. Not one, not one child had a father figure in the home. And in that entire school, only two families were white. And not one in a third grade class had a father in the home. I didn't care. But when the state changed the law, because there were some charter schools that had uncertified and unqualified people teaching. And so Dwart had to leave. But Dwart went back, finished high school, finished college. And when he graduated, <laughs> when he graduated from, and you didn't mention this, from Ohio Dominican, he got the President's Award. And they said his artwork captured the beliefs and the philosophy of that university. He was the one honored senior. And I begged him after he got his college degree to come back and teach. He said, I'm sorry, but your kids aren't poor enough. <laughs> anyway, he's a wonderful wow, man. Uh, 
in addition to be a wonderful artist. Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for all you did for my daughter. Wow. That's amazing. Beautiful. Thank you, Gigi. Oh, my name is Gigi Howard. The school's name is the Arts and College Prep Academy. Academy. She's a founder. And when my daughter was in school, she had to do a residency. And she did it with Duarte because I knew no better person <laughs> to be a mentor for my own child. And that every child had to go back to their school and did a pre do a presentation. I'm not kidding. They looked at her and said, were you afraid? She was because she came never dawned on her. She came to shortstop and she seen all those kids dressed a certain way. Like they look, they just had big shirts on and they were black kids. And so people thought that she would be afraid. But yeah, she looked like a screen in print. The room was black, but yeah, her. She was screen printing and doing things like that. So people yeah, said things like that to her daughter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that question, that comment. Hey, Miss Deirdre, is it possible if Aaron comes up here so we can yes. we can give Aaron, him this picture can forward, and we can please? take a picture with him? Yes, you. Okay. <laughs> hey, Aaron. Yeah, do you want to ask your question? I'm Aaron Schfels. I become a human child. See. You see, I keep drawing about cartoons and anime characters. Soon, I'll be famous superstar, Mr. Or and Ms. Hedo told me, because they're my art teachers from high school. Now, but that, that everyone will keep graduating me because you try to sell me and be an art superstar because I'm becoming a human child. Mm. I'm the greatest kid I ever heard. <laughs> I'll be growing up right now. I could be a dad. What my family told me. And my brother over here, and my sister, Shani, Shani's friend, and my mother, and my baby brother. I can draw on my family and cartoons and anime characters wherever I want. And video games, wherever I want. Oh. That's why I'll be a human child for. I'll be a great superstar, be famous. <laughs> I must say, can you give him that picture? And thank you, Mr. Ward. Yeah. And you are Terrence D. And thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So Moshe's gonna give Aaron this picture to keep. Plus, we're gonna give him something else, not, not in front of everybody, but <laughs> Aaron, you. this is the collaboration we did for Sydney. And um, we want you to have this one. It's got wires on the wall, and it's 15 of these made all together, and this one's for you. For me? Yes, for you to keep. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. Sorry. Also, also while we're standing, this this seed carrot, I brought um, three for Mr. Dean to pick one, so he gets to pick one of these to keep. Wow. Um, yeah. Thank you. And um, so there are three different ones. So anyway, this was uh, on the mind when we knew we were coming. So that was one of the things we wanted to do. I want to acknowledge because there are some of your students who are here or people who work with you. I know Aaron is one, and you can mention. Katarina, Dante, I think that's Malik back there, and Atia. So they can stand up. Yeah, this is stand amazing. Up. Stand up. <laughs> and, and Aaron's brother over there. Mario, Moshe. I think I can't. Wow. I think that's them. Some of them, people here. So the, the culture carriers continue. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he's a sculptor. That's, that's um, Shakur. I always say Tupac to remember his name, but he's, <laughs> they were, these guys were in a show called Brothers that we did at, at All People Art Gallery. So, wow. And um, yes, so, and then we're, we're part of Transit Arts and Whitehall High School. So it's some of the places that we're all part of. Yeah. Amazing. Moshe uh, graduated from Ohio State, became a board at Central Community House, and now he's wow. doing his things out in other corporate ends as accountant. So it's, I met him in the 10th grade and he, he gave me, I was his mentor, but he turned around and mentored me back. <laughs> yeah. Amazing, brilliant, yes, thank sir. you. Well, I just wanna say this has been a phenomenal afternoon. I am warmed by the conversation and I hope you all are too. Um, before we go, I would like to give thanks. First of all, to our Zoom audience who, is with, who are with us and um, I'm sure this will be videotaped so, 
If you would like to share this conversation beyond today, you will be able to. Also, I would like to thank, um, first of all, Dr. Terrence Dean and of course, Richard Duart Brown for, the, for their time and their effort and their, again, their vulnerability and their, their, their sharing today with us. I would like to thank, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I would like to thank Dante Woods Spikes. I got it right this time. <laughs> um, he has just been such um, the documenter. Like, you know, if you're gonna have somebody documenting your life and your work, you want this person who is, does it so sensitively and thoroughly. And I wanna thank you for the photography and for providing the photography on the opening and the closing. I also wanna thank our um, audio visual staff, Nicholas Fields, who's back there waving in the booth. He just comes through every single time. Thank you for, for pulling this together for us. Thank you, Mark Zuzik for handling our Zoom. He is our, uh, our resident um, program director, if you will. And then I also wanna thank the Greater Columbus Arts Council. They are our partner for the Amina Robinson Fellowship Program, as well as our residencies and also, Loann Crane, who has passed on, but continues to bless us with her funding, who actually provided the funding for Richard Duart Brown to have his residency wow. at the house and his fellowship at the house. I also finally wanna thank the Ohio Arts Council for um, the Governor's Awards video that you watched and also thank all of you for being here. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>